this is crazy I'm on the right track, I'm finally found You need some soul searching, the time is now All I need is one mic My heart's like pounding right now My mom had a talk with him about his wife's involvement And how she needed to step back about a week before she died And guess what? He didn't come to see her for the whole week after that. The next time he showed up was the day we had a meeting with the social worker because once again, he wanted to discuss getting her affairs in order. That's all he ever wanted to discuss because that's all he cared about. He came to one doctor's appointment with us in the year she was sick and that was a visit to the oncologist at Stony Brook. At that appointment, he asked a lot of questions that had he been communicating with me or interested in what was going on with her, he'd know the answers to. I'll never forget when he came out and said to the do doctor, so, like, how long does she have left? I looked at my mom and immediately saw her eyes fill up with tears. She was crying. I intervened and asked the doctor not to answer because she clearly didn't want to know. Stephen tried to rephrase his question by then saying, I mean, what's the prognosis? But he had already said it. Who asked that? Disgusting. A few days after my mom was in the hospital, I was on the phone with him and I was so worried about her. I was trying to discuss with him what, what we'd do if she got out of the hospital because she clearly couldn't go home and care for herself at that point. In the middle of me saying something about where she'd live, he cut me off and says to me, one thing we definitely have to do is get her to an elder care attorney because if she ends up in one of those nursing facilities, they're going to take all her money when she dies. I couldn't believe that was even a concern on his, of his at, the mom, at that moment in time. I'm wondering how she's going to survive and he's worried about elder care attorneys. That's not a concern for her, that's a concern for him. Don't know about him, but I much rather would have seen her live and spend all her money on the best care she could get than worry about getting less of an inheritance. He is a disgrace. Time and time again he proved that he was only worried about one person, Stephen, and one thing, money. I tried for my mom to maintain some semblance of a relationship with him, but he made it very hard. I mean, I could be completely wrong, but by the looks of it, from my house, it looked like he was doing a lot of shady stuff. Anyway, back to your excuses. I'm not one to throw people under the bus, and so I won't get into specifics. But if you think my mom complained about me, you should have heard what she had to say about you, and especially Betty. You seem to think her reason for being upset with you and Betty is because I said things to her. I am the scapegoat for everything that goes wrong, huh? You know she asked me every single day when I came up to the hospital if anyone from her family called me. And every day I'd say, no ma, just Nico and my Aunt Dana. After about three weeks of asking she finally asked one last time and I answered no for the last time and she said my family sucks I couldn't even argue with her but I never told her what was going on between us in fact as far as she knew the last thing I told her was that I had apologized to you that was after the first time you came to the hospital I was trying my very best to keep the drama out of her room and that's why I was so angry when you texted me and just assumed it was me fighting with Steven over the healthcare proxy I could tell you got your information from Steven and not my mom because the story was incorrect. There was nothing for me to argue about. I was the healthcare proxy. My mom was actually the one who started the fight and Steven raised his voice to her and was arguing with her about it. This was after my husband watched him send her into a full blown panic attack and accused her of taking him out of her will earlier that day. His name was on the sheet as a secondary. Why should he be the healthcare proxy anyway? He works a full time job and doesn't have the same availability as me. He wasn't around at all. He didn't know what was going on or even what she would have wanted. He was harassing her to fill out this most form so he could know when clearly she wasn't interested. All I said to him was, all you had to do was ask me and I would have showed you the healthcare proxy form. To which he replied, I don't fucking have to ask you for anything. I told him that was psychotic and then I left the room. I heard him arguing with her and carrying on all the way down the hall by the elevators. You didn't have your story straight whatsoever and when I tried explaining myself to you, you accused me of being focused on the wrong things. Yeah, the 12 plus hours a day I sat at the hospital really backs that up, huh? My mom is the one who told me that his wife was calling the social worker on their second day in the hospital asking about her health care proxy. The social worker verified it and she said she kept calling and calling. My mom then asked the social worker not to share that information with her. 
if you are fully aware and okay with the stuff Steven and his wife were doing to my mom while she was dying, then I'm even more disappointed in you than I already was. You of all people know how my mom felt about my brother's wife. You can pretend all you want, but deep down you know. I hear you are telling people that my mom was making amends with her and forgave her. Really? You think that's true? She was tolerating her because Steven threatened her that if she didn't get on board with his wife, she wouldn't see her grandchild. What a nice son, huh? You also probably know about the argument that you got into with her a few weeks before she died. She told me all about it. Once again, she was trying to reach out to one of her sisters and lean on them for support. And just as you continually did to me, you gaslit her, invalidated her, and made her think she was crazy for feeling the way she did. She told me that she had made a comment about how annoying Satan was when she came up to the hospital and how all she did was talk nonstop. And you replied by saying, at least she's trying. My mom said, really? Now she's trying? She had no empathy for me for three years. She was the cause of everything. And then you started to argue with her, saying that it was all of us. My mom told me she got so mad because you knew that I had tried several times to make amends and was shot down every time. She told me that she responded to you by saying it was her, but you kept arguing with her and saying it was all of them. It was suddenly my fault now because you had your own problems with me. That upset her. She said to me, I don't know why she was insisting on arguing with me. I don't know either. Why couldn't you just listen to her and let her vent and be annoyed? She's in the hospital bed on an extremely high dose of painkillers and unable to walk or sleep or breathe or get up to go to the bathroom or control her own bowels or bladder or even sit up straight and support her own weight. She had every right to complain about whatever she wanted to, but no. Debbie's concern was about Debbie being right. My mom wasn't stupid. Back around the time of my brother's daughter's first birthday party, six months after her actual birthday, my mom was starting to notice that no one from her family was commenting on my Facebook pictures of my son. She would bring it up to me on the phone and I'd act as if I didn't notice or I didn't know why. I did that for a long time. When it came time to go to that ridiculous party, I felt I had no choice but to let her know something was going on. I was dealing with enough stress at the time. The night prior to the party, I had to call 911 and rush over to her house at 11.30 p.m. because she fell and fractured her collarbone because she couldn't breathe and she had a Charlie horse in her leg, probably for, because her potassium was too high as a result of her kidney failing. Then she was refusing to go to the hospital. At that time, I was at our house on an almost daily basis, helping her do everything from food shopping to cleaning, etc. And I knew things were just getting worse and worse. I had enough stress. I did not need to stress about a birthday party. For the first time in a really long time, I put my own feelings before everyone else's, even hers. I hadn't spoken to you or anyone for that matter for months by that point. I didn't need to sit there and be fake or be ignored and feel uncomfortable. I didn't think the very obvious tension was going to do my mom any good either. I had no desire to see anyone from this family. My mom was furious with me. I didn't care though. I spent her birthday with her the next day and made it about her, not my kid. I bought Steven's kid a gift and declined the invite. She was really pissed at me and I finally felt like I, it was time I needed to give her some type of explanation and so I told her that I was very concerned for her mental well-being and that I had written a letter to you and Betty and that it's all my fault. I took the blame. I didn't think it would be conducive to her health to be fighting with you guys and since I'm already the family scapegoat and constantly blamed for things even after I haven't spoken to you in over a year now, she insisted I show her the letters, but I refused, and I let her think it was all my fault. Also to her, and to protect you guys, I didn't want to tarnish her idealized views of her wonderful sisters. Do you know how upset she would have been had she seen how dismissive you and Betty were about her depression? My mom knew better, though. I believe she even reached out to Aunt Dana and asked her if she knew what was up. She told Aunt Dana the same thing she told me, that she knows I could be a bitch, but she also knows how her sister Debbie is. You know I read the initial alleged nasty letter that I wrote to you in the weeks after my mom died as I was trying to process everything I went through and for a long time I, ha I even had myself convinced that I was somehow the bad guy. When I took off the rose colored glasses and broke from the Coppola brainwashing I realized that there was absolutely nothing nasty about it. In the letter I apologized profusely for being offensive but the reality is is that nothing I said was offensive. 
when I looked back, I saw someone who was confused, upset, and scared because she knew her mom's situation was far worse than she wanted to believe and that she was reaching out to her aunts because she doesn't have another parent or caring and actively involved sibling to bounce things off of and that she was desperate to help her mom in any way she can to at the very least try to preserve some type of quality of life as she battled her terminal diagnosis. At that point in time, her life and my life completely revolved around her cancer diagnosis. Her symptoms, her pain, her inability to do things, her doctor's appointment, her lab results, her kidney failure, her stitches, her prescriptions, etc. We no longer had normal conversations about everyday things. Everything was about her disease. I couldn't talk to her about my problems because everything I had to complain about just felt so pet petty and insignificant, <laughs> and insignificant in comparison to what she was going through. I was doing everything for her and by myself. As I'm sure you remember, she was also in a bit of denial herself about the situation and so she was being difficult and making excuses. It was the hardest, most confusing, frustrating, upsetting, and frightening things I ever went through. And the one person who I always leaned on for support in these types of situations is the one who's suffering the most. I wrote that letter to you because I wanted and needed help. It was a desperate cry for help. I wrote that letter to you guys because I thought collectively we could help her, help herself, and help her make her suffering a tiny amount less mentally agonizing. There was nothing nasty at all in that letter. Maybe you should go back and read it yourself. But you and Betty go around presenting it as I wrote you both a nasty letter. You are both liars. In fact, over the last year, as I processed everything I had gone through, I went back and read all of the co correspondence between you guys and myself, and I saw many instances where I'm sitting there thanking God for you and how much help you've been. Then I thought, aside from daily phone calls, what else did you really do to help? When I was concerned about her coming out of the hospital from surgery and caring for herself alone, I spoke of valid issues like how is she going to cook for herself, or clean, or do laundry, or get to doctor's appointments, or in and out of her bed, or the tub. And I was being realistic about the fact that I had a three-year-old son and a husband to care for too, and how often I was able to be there for her. And right there, right before my eyes, there you were invalidating my concerns and suggesting I go out and buy her high sodium, preservative packed and completely unhealthy cold cuts. That was your solution. Then you told me that she's not going to work so she won't create a lot of laundry. You kept taunting me in an instigating manner to see if I spoke to a social worker so you could be proven right. Because in your eyes, the one night you were there at the hospital, you would determine that she was absolutely fine. Your answer was to feed my sick, immune-compromised mother whose kidney was failing, was to leave her in dirty clothes and let her live on what can be called the most unhealthy food. Not once did you offer to help in any way. You couldn't even bring yourself to give up a Saturday or Sunday to come spend the day with her or keep her company. And there I was praising you like an asshole when all you really ever did was bring her to a few appointments back at a time when she was definitely able to bring herself, all except one. Then when she was in the hospital last year, for the fifth or sixth time that year, you actually had the balls to tell my husband that you'd come see your beloved sister more often, but you had to go home to your house where your adult daughter and son-in-law also lives and feed your dogs. Feeding your dogs took precedence over visiting your sister who's dying in the hospital. I wonder who fed your dogs when you drove up to Westchester to get a tattoo while my mom was in the hospital. Want to know the truth? My mom said it. She could drive to get a tattoo, but she can't come here. But I don't care. Whatever. And she was right. She did care, and I know it hurt her. Even when you came to the hospital during that last month, you never came alone. You had to wait for Betty and Bob to show for you, and you never once came on a Saturday or Sunday. God forbid you give up one day of your weekend for your dear sister. Why did you never come alone? It was too scary, huh? 
This goes for you and your sister, Betty. You could both keep lying and saying I wrote nasty letters, but the truth is I never wrote her any nasty letters, and the nasty letter you finally did get from me was in response to the one you wrote to me, where you twisted every word I said and accused me of saying that you didn't care about my mom. At that time, I foolishly thought you did, and I didn't write anything in there to imply that you didn't. Everything in that response letter was the absolute truth and I was done with the constant gaslighting, scapegoating, blame shifting, arguing, toxic behavior enabling, and invalidation from you two towards me and especially towards my mother who was completely non-deserving of it. If either of you have to ask why she was upset with you, maybe you should look in the mirror and look at the way you treated her. This is especially true for Betty, who seemed to be purposely going out of her way to upset my mom by constantly kissing Satan's ass on Facebook after being told several times by several people, including myself, that it hurt and upset my mom. She constantly argued with my mom and made her feel like shit, and you know it too. I saw all of the conversations with my own eyes in her Facebook messages, which is why you made sure her account was memorialized. Betty and Betty has to control everyone's perspectives. Don't worry, I have screenshots of everything. Betty and her creepy rat of a husband, Bob. He's another one. He goes and unfriends me and unfriends my mom on Facebook for no reason, and then like a coward, blames his wife. But you guys found it so offensive when another cousin of mine unfriended you that you continually harassed Aunt Dana about it. Meanwhile, just an FYI, she unfriended you in December of 2016 and no one noticed until March 6, 2017, which is the day after my birthday. Hmm, wonder why I was over at my Aunt Dana's house for my birthday that year. Bob went out of his way to upset my mom too, and when she confronted him about it, like a caring brother-in-law would do, he ignored her. Really, what creepy old man is liking every photo of his nephew's wife and her drunk girlfriends out at the bar? He'll be the next one we see on To Catch a Predator. If any of you need to ask why my mom was upset with you, maybe you should look at your own behavior and how you all treated her instead of at me. I didn't force anyone to do any of that stuff. It was all you. I cannot believe there was a time in my life where I actually looked up to you people and I valued your presence in my life. And if you haven't noticed yet, I decided that none of you deserve the distinction of aunt and uncle anymore. No aunt or uncle of mine would treat me the way you all have treated me and my mother. I can see why Betty and Bob resent me, even though it's crazy and makes no sense. But why did they have to treat my mom like shit? Did they resent her for giving birth to me? I've never been so utterly disappointed by other human beings in my life. I am not saying I'm always right or some defenseless, innocent victim. I have done a lot of work on myself in the last year. I own everything I said and did. I can be confrontational. I can be nasty. I can curse. I am reactive and sometimes speak without thinking. I'm outspoken and opinionated. Yes, I said harsh things. Yes, I speak like the love child of a truck driver and a sailor. Yes, I need to work on my approach. Yes, I have anger issues. Yes, I overshare my problems. Yes, I vent to everyone too much. I get it. I know exactly who I am. I have to live with myself every day. I definitely did not handle many situations right in the past year. I fed you the ammunition you used against me, and I realize that now, but I had every right to be upset about my brother's lack of help and what he and his wife were doing. I wasn't asking you to chase them out of, out of the family with pitchforks and torches. I was just looking for validation that what I was going through was hard, but all I got was gaslighting and enabling of their toxic behavior. The one thing I'm truly sorry about is taking it out on my aunt, my cousin Ego's mother, and assuming that she was also part of the Coppola committee. She was truly undeserving of my rage. I believe I have permanently scarred our relationship and that makes me terribly sad. She was the only one who was trying to do something to actually help my mom. She was the only one who validated her. With that said, at least she afforded me an opportunity to explain myself and showed some compassion for what I was going through and she left the door open for me to talk to her anytime. She at least had some understanding of what it's like to care for an ailing parent without any help and can empathize. That's more than I could say for the three of you. I honestly didn't even 
mean to write you anything that was even a small fraction as this long when I originally started to write but I've held this in for over a year now and since you have decided to keep yourself involved by being a false witness for my brother and you continue talking shit about me to other family members I figured I'd say something I just need to know a few things if you knew for sure that my mom could see what you were doing now and have been doing, do you think she would be happy? Do you think she'd be happy with the fact that you and Betty have been the driving force that's further pushing the wedge between in between her two children? Do you think she'd be okay with your relationship with my brother's wife? Do you think she'd be happy that you have no compassion for me and that you continue to try to rally other family members against me? Do you think she'd think it was okay that I tried to reach out to you after I filed her will and you ignored me? Do you think she'd be happy about the lies you were telling about me? Do you think she'd be happy that you encouraged my brothers and his wife's sneaky and shady behavior and that you co-sign everything they do? Do you think she'd be happy that you've ignored my son and haven't so much as sent him a Christmas card or acknowledged his birthday for two years? And why are you ignoring Nico and her kids? What did they do? Do you think she'd be happy you stalked me on a daily basis from Nana's Facebook page along with your former friend and your ex-boyfriend for months following her death? Do you think she was happy when Bob was standing in her hospital room while she was laying there dying, unable to speak for herself, talking shit about me with Satan and saying how I was dead to him? Do you think she'd be happy that my brother and his wife had someone come up to the hospital and plan her funeral before she was even dead? Which, by the way, according to a former 20-year employee of the funeral home, they have never gone to a hospital to do that before. Do you think she'd be happy that they were in a rush to get her in her urn so they could celebrate Thanksgiving? How about how Bob was practically a conjoined twin with Satan at her wake services and, and her house when he stuffed himself into her oversized chair with her? Do you think she'd be happy that Betty and Bob were the catalyst to all of this nonsense when they lied to my brother and told him I was trying to get my mom to write him out of her will? Do you think she'd be happy with the way you betrayed her? Do you think she'd be happy with, with you at all? All you have done to me in the last year is prove that your anger towards me is more important than your respect, love, and loyalty to my mother. On her last night here, I sat in her room with her alone for the entire night after everyone left. I cannot tell you how scary it was to see her in that condition. Have you ever seen what someone looks like during the last few hours of their life? It's not a pretty sight. Their skin starts to take on a mottled appearance. It turns shades of gray and blue. They lose muscle control and open wide and stay that way. Their breathing slows to one breath every few seconds. Not to be morbid or crude, but they look like zombies. I sat there for hours staring at my 62-year-old mother like that all by myself while everyone else was snuggled up in their nice cozy beds. I sat there for hours and watched her chest go up and then down a few seconds later thinking that every breath could be her last. I listened to the gurgling sound they refer to as the death rattle. At one point, the nurses asked me to leave the room so they could clean her up a bit. I had never been asked to leave the room before. They said it was too disturbing to watch when patients are in that condition. When I came back, I went in my bag and got my cross with my dad's ashes from my bag. I put it in her hand and wrapped her fingers around it and held them. I told her that my dad was waiting for her and that she should not worry about me anymore. Through her 32 day stay, she was constantly apologizing to me for what my life turned into. I told her that I was there because I wanted to be, not because I had to be. There's a difference. I saw one of her eyes pop open, and so I walked around to the other side of the bed where she could see me. I told her that she was the most amazing mother anyone could ask for, and that if I was even half as good a mother to my son as she was to me, I'd be okay. I told her how she always compared herself to her sisters, and she said she was the ugly sister. And I told her she was wrong because she was by far the most beautiful one because she had the most beautiful heart. It's the truth. Then I heard three muffled and strained syllables come out. I asked her to repeat herself, and she somehow got the strength to say them a little louder. She said, I love you. She couldn't talk anymore, but I watched her mouthing it over and over again. 
Then I asked her, did you say I love you? And she nodded her head one time. I saw a tear come out of her one open eye and I wiped it away from her face. I told her that I loved her too more than she could ever know and I squeezed her hand again. I promised her that I would fix everything. She didn't close that eye for the rest of the night. She was so afraid to die. The last thing she wanted was to die knowing that I was going to be alone with no family. In fact, the last conscious words she said to me days before when I was cleaning her room up and helping her clean her teeth for the next day, as I did every night for the 32 nights she was there, was after I asked her what she wanted next, she said I want my family. That was all she wanted for the last three years. Think of what a simple thing that is to want. I know I tried to give that to her. I can't say the same for my brother or for you or Betty. I know I did everything in my power to make her life better. Yeah, I may have upset her at times along the way. Such is life. I've heard you complain about your daughter and I sure have heard her complain about you. When my mom woke up while every, everyone was there, I heard that she looked around the room and every time she did, the first person she asked for was me. I did everything in my power to help her and she could have died at any point in time while everyone was there, but she died alone with just me holding her hand. You could try to tear me down in every way possible. You could go tell Steven I stole items from the safe. You could call all your extended family and tell them what a horrible person I am. You could spread your lies about me destroying the will. You could say I am dead to you. You could continue to stalk me on every form of social media and call me a big mouth and blame me for everything that happens in your life for the next 50 years. But the one thing you cannot do is take that away from me. I did everything I could possibly do for her and I held her hand until the moment she died. I spent every second of time that I could spend with her and you cannot take that away from me. You have no idea what I've been through in the last two years. You have no idea who Steven really is and who his wife really is and how much they lied to her, to me and even to you. I think now that my mom can see everything from where she is, she knows that I did fix things. I fixed them for me. I fixed my life and for the first time ever, I'm living my life for myself. Although I miss her every second of every day, I'm okay. I know I wouldn't be where I am today without her guidance throughout the past year. I wouldn't have won the battle I fought and got named as executor on her will so I could carry out her wishes in the way she wanted them carried out. I would have never been able to see all the lies and shady stuff you, Betty, Bob, Stephen and Satan did without her intervention and you best believe she is with me every second of every day still. One thing for, is for sure, I am loved. I fill my life with people who lift me up instead of those who try to bring me down. I know I tried to do what was right by my mom and always had her best interest at heart and not my own. I am supported. I am reminded constantly of what a good daughter I was and how much she loved me and you can't put a price tag on that. And you, Debbie, cannot take that away from me. I never heard back from her after that.